what are the things that anyone and everyone can do, should do, to to live longer, basically. How long you got? Uh, well, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. Um, I'd like to live to be. I'd like my final decade to be between ninety and a hundred. Oh no, I meant how long? <laughs> no, no, do you, yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah. kidding. I'm just and kidding. will we spend from now until you're ninety talking uh, about this? Well, there's a risk of that. So, so let's start with a couple of the things that you've already highlighted. Right? So smoking. How much does smoking increase your risk of all-cause mortality? And, and the reason we like to talk about what's called ACM or all-cause mortality is it's really agnostic to how you die. And that doesn't always make sense. I mean, if you're talking about, you know, a, a very specific intervention like an anti-cancer therapeutic, you really care about cancer-specific mortality or heart-specific mortality. But when we talk about these sort of broad things, we like to talk about ACM. So, you know, using smoking, smoking is approximately a 40% increase in the risk of ACM. And what does that translate to? And um, that means I'm I'm shortening my life by 40%? No, it means at any point in time, there's a 40% great, greater risk that you're going to die relative to a non-smoker and Got a it. never smoker. Yeah, yeah. So it's important to distinguish. It doesn't mean your lifespan is going to be 40% less. It means at any point in time standing there, your risk of death is 40% higher. Um, and by the way, that'll catch up, right? At some point that, that catches up. Uh, high blood pressure, about a 20 to 25% increase in all-cause mortality. Um, you take something really extreme like end-stage kidney disease. So these are patients that are on dialysis waiting for a, a, an organ. And again, there's a confounder there because there's what's the underlying condition that leads you to that? It's you know, profound hypertension, you know, significant type two diabetes that's been uncontrolled. You know, that's enormous. That's about 175% increase in ACM. So the hazard ratio is like 2.75. Um, type two diabetes is probably about a 1.25 as well. So 25% increase. So now the question is like, how do you improve? So what are the things that improve those? So now here we do this by comparing low to high achievers on other metrics. So if you look at low muscle mass versus high muscle mass, what is the improvement? And it's pretty significant, it's about 3x. So if you compare low muscle mass people to high muscle mass people as they age, the low muscle mass people have about a 3x hazard ratio or a 200% increase in all-cause mortality. Now, if you look at the data more carefully, you realize that it's probably less the muscle mass fully doing that and it's more the high association with strength. And when you start to tease out strength, you can realize that strength could be probably three and a half X as a hazard ratio, meaning about 250% greater risk if you have low strength to high strength. And high strength is the ability to move loads at 80 to 90% so it's all of defined, one it's, it's all defined by given studies. So some the most common things that are used are actually, you know, they're used for the purposes of experiments that make it easy to do. And I don't even think they're the best metrics. So they're usually using like grip strength, um, leg extensions and like wall sits, squats, things like that. Okay. So how long can you sit in a squatted position at 90 degrees without support would be a great demonstration of quad strength, a leg extension, um, you know, how much weight can you hold for how long relative to body weight, things like that. Until your VO2 max is at least to the 75th percentile and you're able to dead hang for at least a minute and you're able to wall sit for at least two, like we could rattle off a bunch of relatively low hanging fruit. Dead hang for about a minute. Seems like a, a really good goal for a lot of people, at least. To... That's our that's our goal. I think we have a minute and a half is the goal for a 40 year old woman. Two minutes is the goal for a 40 year old man. So we adjust them up and down based on uh, age and gender. Great. And then uh, the wall sit, what's, what are some we numbers? We don't use that... a wall sit. We do a, a, just a straight squat, air squat at 90 degrees. Um, and I believe two minutes is the standard for both men and women at 40. Because for some people thinking in terms of VO2 max is a little more complicated. They might not have access to the equipment or the, to measure it, et cetera. Um, what can we talk about, think about in terms of cardiovascular? So run a mile at uh, seven minutes or less, eight minutes or uh, less? That's a good question. So there are VO2, there are really good VO2 max estimators online and you can plug in your activity du jour. So be, be it a bike, run or rowing machine and it can give you a sense of, of that. And I, I don't, rem I used to know all of those, oh, okay. but now that I just actually do the testing, I don't recall them, but it's exactly that line of thinking. Like, can you run a mile in this time if you can? Your VO2 max is approximately this. And then um, you mentioned deadlifting body weight 10 times. I just made that one up. We don't, that's not one that we include, but but something I mean, uh, something like that. Um, we use we use farmer carries. So we'll say for a male, you should be able to farmer carry 
your body weight for, uh, I think we have two minutes. Right. So that's half your body weight in each hand. Um, you should be able to walk with that for, for two minutes. Um, for women, I think we're doing 75% of body weight or something like that, yeah. As indirect measures of how healthy and yeah, uh, huge we are and how long we're gonna yeah, live. It's basically grip strength, it's mobility. I mean, again, walking with that much weight for, for some people initially is really hard. Um, you know, we use different things like vertical jump, ground contact time, if you're jumping off a box, things like that. So it's it's really trying to capture, and it's it's an evolution, right? Like I think the the test is going to get only more and more involved as we as we as we get involved because it took us about a year. Beth Lewis did the majority of the work to develop this. Um, Beth runs our strength and stability program in the practice, and you know basically I just tasked her with like, hey, go out to the literature and come up with all of the best movements that we think are proxies for what you need to be like the most kick-ass, you know, what we call centenarian decathlete, which is the person living in their marginal decade at the best. 